South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and iGrow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Okay, I think with that we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got the producer panel. We certainly appreciate these three gentlemen coming here today. It's never easy to sit in front of your neighbors and talk, but we appreciate you doing that. So um, I'm going to let them do their own autobiography. They've, they've kind of got a little short PowerPoint presentation. We'll go through those, take a couple of questions after each producer, and then at the end, when all three of them have completed their presentations, we'll open it up for a general question and answer session. So if you don't get your question in, and right after they talk, we'll have plenty of time at the end to take all questions. So, all right, with that, Matt Bainbridge, why don't you wave your hand quick here? He's going to kick things off, and then Justin Schoenrock is going to be our second presenter, and Paul Hetland will be our third presenter. So, Matt is willing to be first, so I'll let you take it away, Matt. I didn't really have a choice whether to be first or not. They kind of told me it was. So. <clears throat> I'm glad to see so many people here. I think this is a really important topic that we're going through today. And, and I guess I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've tried on our farm and, and uh, what, what we've had success with and what, what maybe hasn't worked as good as we thought it would, too. So um, I farm with my dad and my brother just down south here by Ethan. We grow corn, soybeans, winter wheat. Um, alfalfa, we have a cow calf operation and we background calves too. And, and um, here's some of the things we've tried with cover crops. This was last spring and it was really, really early in April. In fact, we actually had a little bit of snow on it after we, after we planted the oats. But we, uh, we wanted to plant oats on the corn stalks ahead of soybeans. So we tried it two different ways with the no-till drill and then with, uh, with just our spinner box too. And we had, we had pretty decent success. We didn't have a lot of growth, but, but um, I think we got enough. I'll show on the next slide here. I think we got enough to actually do a little bit of good. So it's something we're gonna keep on trying and experimenting with. The uh, drilled oats definitely came up a lot better right away. The ones with the spinner box, they kind of laid there for a while and actually came up kind of later on in the growing season when I didn't want them to come up. So it kind of caused a little bit of a mess, but but I really didn't see anything on the yield monitor for difference, so I don't think it hurt us too bad. So here's really what the whole point of this was. This is what we were trying to do to our soil. <clears throat> you can see we only got about six inches of growth, but if you look at what's going on underneath the ground, I think that's where a big benefit was. I especially like the middle picture there. We can see how the, the roots are, are grabbing that soil and holding on to it like a glue there. And, and really the root systems are as deep as, as what the top growth was too. It's about the same amount of inches. So it's really made a, a really nice seed bed to plant soybeans in too. And, and really, I, I think we got a lot of benefits out of there too, especially if we'd have a, a really early spring, heavy rain or something, you know, having something extra out there to hold the soil, I think is a, is a big benefit. Uh, one of the new things we tried this year was trying to spin on uh, cover crop seed into corn. And you can see there on the picture on, on the left there, we went through when the corn was as tall as I could still drive my tractor and my spreader through there. And, and we just put out some uh, crimson clover, ryegrass, and turnips out there. And you can see there on the, the picture on the right, we did get a little bit of growth, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite what we were hoping for. Um, all the ryegrass seed is pretty pretty light and we couldn't throw it as far as what we, we thought we'd be able to. And I, I noticed that as I was doing it, but I thought maybe if the seeds kind of, uh, kind of separated themselves as they got spun out, that I could see kind of some differences too in what all grew and they'd kind of be separate at different widths and then all together in the middle. And, and we ended up kind of with a streaky cover crop in the, in the corn, but. But it's something, um, maybe a different seed, maybe this will work better in the future. Um, here we're trying some winter rye. 
I actually did uh, did some winter rye and some winter wheat with the spinner box and soybeans to try and right before they would drop their leaves. And what I was hoping I could do here was on some of the some of the alkali spots, get something growing there and using moisture. And what actually happened was I got it to work really good where the soybeans were already really good. I think it was just a matter of the leaves kind of falling and, and kind of mulching the seed there. So we had uh, good results, but not the results I was expecting, I guess. And the picture on the right there is just what it looks like in the spring. We were just drilling soybeans into that field. And, and that's actually on, a, on an alkali spot that we drilled with, with winter rye the year before. And, and we were pretty happy with the results there. We definitely got, got a better stand with the drill on some of those tougher soils. Um, here's the easy one, the cover crop after wheat. And on the left there, that's just a, kind of an early emergence picture. You can see they're, they're getting a pretty nice start there in between the, the rows of wheat. We didn't really do that on purpose, but it kind of worked out that way, I guess. This is the one that to me is a real no-brainer, especially if you grow wheat and if you have cattle. This is just a home run in my opinion. You get so much grazing out of that. Cattle prefer the cover crops over over corn stalks or anything else that you can have for them late in the fall. So this really is, has worked out good for us this year and we keep on kind of changing up what, what, what different plants or different species are putting out there every year. We started off, which seems to be the popular thing to do, turnips out there right now. And that's kind of how we started too. We're kind of moving more towards um, added oats in there now. And we actually added some sunflowers too. We were finding that, that mostly with the turnips and radishes and that those kind of mixes that we were getting too much breakdown and <clears throat> and really there was hardly anything left out there in the in the spring and that kind of caused a few problems with um, really short pieces of wheat straw that we had a little bit of a hard time with hair pinning with that. These other two pictures here on the right, I just took those yesterday. You can see, especially in that bottom picture, how we've got a little bit more structure there to the to the oats that are left over, and they're almost rowed up there. And I think, you know, it's not a big difference, but I think we did catch a little bit more snow that way, and and uh, definitely have longer longer stems left out there. This is on our high yield plot. We enter the yield contest for corn and soybeans every other year, depending on the crop. You can see here, this is really really heavy corn residue and when we were planting into it, it definitely wasn't easy. You really had to pay attention to your planter setup. But this is on 221 bushel corn, and the cattle were only out there for a little while, and really, really heavy residue. And we ended up with uh, 71 bushel soybeans on this plot this year. So, so you don't have to turn it black to get a big yield. Um, here's what I call the easy no-till. On the left there is this winter wheat on burned off alfalfa. If you're not used to, to no-till, I like to say you set yourself up to be successful. You plant into an easy situation. On the right, we planted no-till alfalfa. We planted that into some rye that we planted in the fall when we took it off for a hay crop. And it's just a perfect easy seed bed, easy to no-till into. So I guess that's it. Okay, we can take a couple of questions from Matt while we're getting set up for our next presenter. Yes, sir. Did you pick the straw off that weed stubble where you had the cover crop? Uh, no, where, where I took the picture there, and I'm glad you brought this up, I meant to make that point too, was we left all the weed straw out there. It was over eight bushel wheat. We blew the straw out behind the combine. We planted a cover crop. We actually spread cattle manure, about 15 tons of cattle manure, and then we grazed the, the cover crop. So you can see there wasn't a whole lot left out there. You know. Everything is doing its job. It's digested and melted into the soil. Okay. I'm going to try to repeat the question. We're trying to film this, so it's getting harder to hear. So, next question, please. Yes, sir. Do you spread manure? Did you do that before or after you plant it? The question is, do you spread manure before or after you plant it? We actually did it afterwards, just for a timing thing. We, you know, we need, we wanted to get the cover crop out there and get it established. And, <laughs> And after that, we had a chance to run the manure spreader out there. And we damaged the cover crops a little bit because they were already coming up, but, but it really wasn't noticeable once, once they got established. Okay, let's do one more question, and then we'll let Justin... Where do you put that? Where do you put 
the question is where the oats went, did you use any herbicide? Um, on the oats that I planted soybeans afterwards? <coughs> yeah, I, I just burnt it all around up in my pre, this right after I planted. Yep, I burnt the oats out. Okay, with that we're going to move on to our next presenter. Remember we'll come back when everybody's done for a final question and answer. So if you have any other questions for Matt, you can catch him at the end here. Uh, Justin actually, i got to tell some stories because he's my neighbor, so I'm trying to embarrass him too bad. Actually, he, Justin's one of these guys that he's definitely not only talking the talk, he's walking the walk. I can attest to that person like the deliver right across the road from him. And I think it was about probably the first year I was out there, uh, he had a cover crop field right across the road from my house. And so the first day the cows were out there, I was sitting there with my binoculars looking out the window. My wife was like, what in the world are you doing? I said, this is fascinating watching these cows pick out these cover crops, pick the species out. So you're providing good entertainment too for me, Justin. I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, Justin, what do you mean? Uh, Justin Chonrock from Fulton area, farm in Anson County. My dad have a corn, wheat, and soybean rotation with, with uh, stock cattle. Uh, we first, of course, started with the uh, cover crops into small grains and with the turnips and radishes and some lentils. More for a cattle feed than anything, I guess. And, started and, and we still do plant but behind the small grains but same as Matt was saying we found it was burning up a lot of residue just just doing the turnips and radishes so we, we've kind of gone to mixing that in with uh, some cereal rye and, and things like that we've kind of gone to plant some cereal rye and actually taking it for silage and then planting soybeans and having some effect on the yield but not not terrible And our reasoning, I guess, for cover crops is we, we want to increase the organic matter, increase the infiltration of the water and soil, and kind of alleviate compaction if we can, <coughs> and it gives an extra place for, for grazing livestock. This is some a field where we that was CRP probably for 15 years. It's been soybeans and then corn now, and, and they flew a uh, cover crop on of, of the winter rye with, with some radishes. And it's uh, going a bit of work every year, but it, it got a good rain after it was flown on this year and worked, worked pretty well. Did the same thing on, on a Milo field. Questions for Justin? Yes, sir. When you're grazing the cattle on the terrace of radishes, have you noticed that they'll actually prefer that even the corn stalks even up this late in the year? Oh, yeah. Question yeah. is when you're grazing your turnips and radishes, they prefer that over the corn stalks? Yeah, oh, yeah, they prefer. I mean, they'll, you basically have to lock them out of it or they'll, they'll keep going out. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what time of year it is, they'll, they'll dig through a lot of snow for that. When you're live pulling on those radishes of corn, how much rain did you get after you filled on it? Is it putting the stand? There was, there was a good inch, inch and a half of rain. I mean, it was a good rain. Can you count on your house soon after you had to fill it on? Oh, we would have combined, you know, in the late October probably on it. One more question. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on, but you can come back and ask Justin. Some toward the end. Okay, our next presenter is Paul Hetland, and Paul and I, let's see, we have uh, daughters playing the same softball thing, so we get to talk farming there, and we're the same church, so we get to talk farming there. One thing that always uh, I find interesting about Paul is he's an accountant by trade before he became a farmer. So he's always got the numbers and sense running through his head, which I find very fascinating. You can tell when Paul does something, he's thought through real well, and it's, it makes economic sense as well. So looking forward to Paul's talk. I'm Paul Hetland. Uh, I farm Northwest of Mitchell here uh, with my brother Mark. Um, our exhibit.
existing, let's see here, our existing rotation right now consists of corn, soybeans, winter wheat, and to date we primarily try to take advantage of winter wheat in our rotation to utilize cover crop seeding. Um, the cover crop species that uh, we currently work with, radish, turnip, uh, oats, peas, clover, vetch, and flax. We typically try to have at least three, if not up to five, varieties in a blend when we plant. Uh, some of our objectives are to, our primary objective is to build soil health. We're trying to increase organic matter. Uh, we're trying to uh, protect the soil surface. Um, some of the other things that we're trying to do is alleviate shallow compaction or traffic compaction, um, improve water infiltration, uh, recycle and sequester nutrients, um, try and help break down that wheat stubble that's left over, um, some fixing of nitrogen, and we're also, the, the gap between when we harvest that wheat and when we plant that next year corn crop, uh, we have such a period of time with, with no uh, roots actively growing in the soil, we like to kind of bridge that gap and put something back out there for the soil uh, health, for the microbes and things of that nature, um, specifically mycorrhizae, we try and concentrate on, on uh, crops that have a, a good relationship there. Um, you know, when I think about cover crops, we're going to have some, some slides here. Um, you know, we've seen everything from a complete failure, uh, such as 2012. We're very dependent on moisture to be able to establish these crops after harvesting wheat. And if that's not there, and in, in this part of the world, um, late July through early to mid-August, those are difficult times to come across moisture sometimes. So it's it's not a slam dunk, it, it's not uh, a guarantee, but we feel like it's worth it to uh, be out there and, and be seeding those crops every year. Uh, the comment was made, you never know when that rain's going to come along, a quarter of an inch, a third of an inch. And these crops will establish quite quickly. So we have no 2012 slides. That, that was kind of our failure. Um, we're going to look at some 2013 slides, which I would say is somewhere in the middle of uh, a failure and a success just because of the uh, kind of partial stand and, and not quite as much development as we'd like to see in terms of, of uh, tonnage out there, but still certainly um, a benefit. So 2012, we seeded probably three quarters and saw very little germination, if any, and, and probably didn't work out like we wanted it. Uh, 2013, this is one of our wheat fields, and I think we'll get to see, uh, in this mix we had turnips, radishes, oats, crimson clover, and field peas. This is on uh, right about Labor Day. Um, typically, we we like to um, chase the combine to the extent that we can and get these crops in the ground, although sometimes we will try and wait for one uh, flush of volunteer wheat cone that we can burn off uh, before doing the cover crop so that that wheat doesn't, doesn't challenge the cover crop and you know, crowd it out. This is just a, a close-up shot of, of that same field and you can see some of the the oats and the, the different um, varieties there. This is just two weeks later, and you, you can see that once they do establish and start to grow, they will grow fairly quickly. So um, it is deceiving, but you, you can uh, you can get some good tonnage out there fairly quickly. And a lot of these varieties are fairly winter hardy, so even after a killing frost, they will continue to, to grow and do good things. This is 2014, and I wish I could take credit for taking that picture, uh, but it's just a, a ground level shot in there again, and this, this was luck on our part, but we were able to get down the center of the, of the uh, existing wheat rows that were there. Uh, you can see the oats 
primarily here, but there's a, a turnip or a radish coming a little further back in the picture and um, just kind of tells you. And I want to say, I don't know if there's a date on this, but um, it's the 21st of August. Um, we're going to get to see a shot of that field later in the year. I don't have a lot of pictures of 2014, so. I apologize for that. We're, we're going to watch a video. One of the things that we do like to utilize our cover crop for as well is we've got a couple of uh, hog finishing barns that we um, inject manure into uh, some of these fields in the fall. And we typically do that after Labor Day, but usually before the fall harvest kicks off, which is around the 1st of October. That's a little earlier than I'd like to go out with. Uh, something like that, but I feel a little better about doing it uh, where there is a, an actively growing crop that will uh, help us recycle any of those free nutrients and, and kind of lock those up a little bit. Um, so I think, I think okay, here we go. There, there's a video here, and the video is not great. This is of me injecting into that same field that we just saw, and this is this is probably around the second week of September, but you can see the growth there that, that we've got on that. And, um, you know, I, I like that practice of being able to, uh, to put that manure out there. I feel a little bit safer doing it that way. And there's actually a synergy. We really see a, a crop response as well because there's a lot of fertility. So uh, those cover crops, if, if you continue to have good weather and, and get any rain at all, well, they'll, they'll just blow up behind that application so um, it, it's a low disturbance application we're not uh, we're not turning up any soil or, or blowing up any dirt there so the other thing I like about the cover crop as well is is it does give me um, a little bit of support this is probably one of the uh, the jobs that I have to be the most careful with in terms of compaction and, and things like that so it just gives me a little um, extra um, support there. Now this is what that field looks like uh, right at the end of January, so just a couple weeks ago. I went out and I, I snapped a picture there so that you can see how quickly that residue breaks down and um, you know if we do have a wet spring or a lot of times in the spring our moisture doesn't go away very quickly. It can be a problem for us but we can get out on that and, and usually plant fairly easily, um, you know, the comment was made this morning that um, a lot of times that residue will just kind of wash your tires off or keep them clean. We don't really pull up any, any mud or anything and um, if we can get that crop out of the ground, I really like that, that residue there to, to keep that soil surface cool and, and we've done some measuring, we're going to try and do some more, but there are times where we are five degrees or more cooler on the soil surface with that type of residue than a conventionally like corn into a, a soybean field. So I think there's something to that as well. So um, I think that's the end of my presentation. So. Okay. Questions for Paul? When you have oats in the uh, cover crop rotation, how do you control the volunteer winter wheat? The question is, when you have oats in the rotation, how do you control the winter wheat, volunteer winter wheat? At that point, you really don't, and then the wheat just kind of becomes part of your cover crop as well. And so um, that's why sometimes I will wait to see if I can get that first flush of wheat coming and take it out. In the spring then, in 2013, after <coughs> that, 2012, and you didn't get very good germination on the cover crop, mm -hmm. what type of problems did that pose, if any, from that not germinating then in the fall? The question is, when you didn't get good germination, did that cause any problems in the following fall? That's a good question. I, I would have anticipated quite a few, but I, I didn't have a lot of pressure. Um, we do use a pre-emerge. Uh, herbicide on our corn and we do burn down um, uh, ahead of planting um, so I didn't have to do anything outside of my normal herbicide program. 
Okay, any more questions for Paul? Yes, sir. is how does the hog manure relate to the fertility issues with your following crops? Usually with the hog manure we'll put out somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of what we feel is a total fertility need. Um, I don't feel like the cover crop has really hurt us because we do have the cover crops that um, are fixing nitrogen as well. Um, so I, I can't say that I've, I've noticed any detriment. We, we reserve that option in the spring. We, we're, we're doing a lot of tissue sampling and things to try and make sure that we're not shorting that crop. That's a concern. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to ratchet those rates down to be as efficient as we can without hurting yield. And, and so we start about V4 with tissue sampling and kind of, our goal is to go through VT uh, at, at various stages throughout that crop development. And, and just make sure, but we do have the option. Uh, we, we talk to us a lot of our wheat, and so we can always go out there and add 20 or 30 nit units of nitrogen if we need to, or, or whatever, uh, if we feel like we're at risk. But we haven't seen any issues really to, that I'm aware of. Okay, good question. <coughs> Hearing none, gentlemen, thank you so much. That was very informative and certainly appreciate. Let's give them a big hand.